That I'm supposed to be a part of. Because I have so, um, if you're talk about that, just take the initiative okay. to start it, please. Should I should I email Diane, Mrs. Mittler for the numbers? The coordinator yeah. list. Um, I don't think she has it, and um, she's actually sick. Oh. So, um, I'll she try to find it. out if all the coordinators can give me their names for in this class and numbers, and then I'll tell Dr. Albuja to get the information from her class so that we can actually pull that group together. Because one, I need to be able to communicate with the coordinators by themselves, but just okay, to give you directives. And um, all that information given to the advertising group by Kim today should be known by all the um, all the coordinators, because there are a lot of deadlines in there that you guys need to know. The budget group, um, that was my fault. She actually wanted to meet with you guys, and I thought it was an error. So she's coming at four, okay? So she'll meet you guys at four um, in this classroom, and then she'll go over some of the um, like the packages that we're selling and stuff like that for the health care, so how you can raise money um, with that. Okay. So we'll go from there. Um, yes, ma'am. Yes, I did. Just come to me at the big at the at June of break, and I'll um, update you. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so um, you'll find your PowerPoint reflects um, a lot of things that maybe not in your book. Your book is very old. I'm not sure why um, we're even still using it because it still talks about healthy people 2010. Um, yeah, we're on 20. We're going on 2030. Yeah. So. Um, a lot of the information, some of the information is good because epidemiology, what is epidemiology is not going to change. The historical perspective of epidemiology is not going to change. But my PowerPoints have other stuff in here that I want you to also focus on. So if you want to ask me what's going to be on the test, because I know usually you guys are usually test driven when you're in school, when you get out of practice, you kind of think a little broader. But when you're in class, you want to know what's going to be on the test. It's going to come from my PowerPoints. Okay? Um, and whatever else I talk about in class. So. Don't stress, just relax. We're gonna discuss most of everything that you're gonna be tested on, okay? So just, just breathe. Um, I know some of you are freaking out. It's different, oh my God, the PowerPoint is different than the book. Don't, don't freak out. 
time. Um, usually a person of my word. So usually. <laughs> I change my mind often. Okay, so what is epidemiology? Uh, and why is it important for health promotion and disease prevention to have a component of epidemiology? Anybody? I have a definition up there. Um, so based on what my definition says up there, why do you think it's an integral component of health promotion and disease prevention? Prevent. Do you know what you're targeting? One. Go ahead. If we don't have the disease that caused them, we don't have to prevent them. Exactly. That's you. What about distribution? If we know who's most likely to be affected, we know like better screening. Beautiful. Susceptibility. So we want to know who's susceptible. And how do we know who's susceptible if we don't surveillance? When we surveillance, what is, who's in the assessment group here? Nobody's in the assessment group in this class? Yes. Okay. Assessment group. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's keep no, um, well, your assessment group starts the first surveillance, okay? And the surveillance gives you what? The pulse of the community. So when you're looking at how you're gonna approach a population, you have to know the pulse. And the pulse is like the vital um, support center. Like, it, what, what makes the community go? And that's what you're looking at when you're looking at the pulse of the community. Just like our pulse in our body, if it's not going, then we gotta jump start it, then the body doesn't work. The pulse of the community operates pretty much in the same kind of um, sphere. So when you're looking at the pulse of the community, you wanna know what drives it. Who's there, you know? Um, what um, industries is in that community? What do they produce if they do produce anything? Um, you know, what type of schools do they have in that community? Um, do they have parks in that community? It, it um, always baffles me when people say, you know, why don't they exercise? And then you go, like, where do they live? And where they live, do they have a park? And if they don't have a park, do they have sidewalks? And if they don't have sidewalks, do they have a gym? And if they don't have a gym, do they have a playground? And if they have a playground, are there needles on the playground? And if there are needles on the playground, is there prostitution in that playground? <coughs> okay? Is there drugs? Is there violence? Okay? So if you have a patient in front of you, that you need to change their lifestyle. You gotta know what their community looks like because you have to know what drives their behavior. And their behaviors may be driven by a whole <coughs> lot of other things besides putting food in their mouths, okay? So you have to look at all aspects of what drives behavior. And when you're doing your screenings, when you're looking at the populations that you're gonna treat, whether you're acute care or family, you really have to look at the background of that person. You have to look at the socioeconomic status. You have to look at the cultural variance of that person. Um, I know I come from the Caribbean. I come from the U.S. Virgin Islands. We love teas. We believe bush tea cures everything. If you have an ailment, there is a bush tea for that. Okay. I was home over the holidays, and my mother wanted to make me lizard soup. <laughs> Lisa? I refused to eat any soup that she had in the house because she thought that lizard soup was going to cure my asthma. And so she kept trying to give me lizard soup. And I'm like, I am not drinking that. She was like, you're going to drink it, but you're not going to know what you drink. I was like, I'm not going to drink any soup. <laughs> okay? But we believe in natural remedies. So if you have a person who is in your hospital bed from the Caribbean and you ask them, what type of medications do you take? And they say, well, I don't take any medications. And you say, okay, good, no medications. But then you give them something and their blood pressure plummets because they just drank a whole bunch of papaya leaf or something like yeah. that that actually can drop the blood pressure. <coughs> or they have moringa and they took everything else. You gotta ask them what else they take. Do you take any herbal products? Do you take any teas? Because they don't think of it as medicinal. They don't talk about it as complementary medicine. They think of it as, it's just bush tea. And I use the bush tea to cure my blood pressure, okay? 
So these are things that you have to all take into consideration when you're taking care of people and when you're looking at populations that you're going to treat. Okay? So epidemiology is a study of how and why diseases are distributed in the populations, why some get sick and some don't. Okay? Signs. <coughs> Signs objective or subjective? Objective. Objective. Okay, because you're looking at, you can measure um, what they're telling you. Okay, you're seeing it. Okay, um, these are objective components of a disease process. What are symptoms? Are they objective or subjective? Yes, yes, subjective. Okay, subjective. Okay, and when we say subjective versus <coughs> objective, I want you to remember because in health assessment is going to come up again. And we're going to talk about objective versus subjective. And objective means that I'm, it's something measurable. Measurable. Okay? That's what objective is. And subjective <coughs> means that it's what the patient says. Yeah. Okay? okay? So anything the patient says is subjective. Anything you can measure is objective. So your vital signs, blood pressure, heart rate, all that stuff is objective labs. Um, those are all objective variations. Okay? And then your subjective are the things that... Oh, well, I'm nauseous. Can you measure nausea? No. Okay? You can measure their vomiting, how many times they vomited. Okay? And vomiting may be a sign of abdominal obstruction. Okay? But nausea is very subjective. I can't measure it. I don't know. You know, you're nauseous. How, how nauseous are you? It's hard. Okay? 55%. Morbid <coughs> conditions. What are morbid conditions? Asthma. Coronary disease. disease. Okay? Okay? Do morbid, uh, morbid conditions only um, illnesses? No. 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 And obesity. Obesity. Um, that's kind of like a disease. I think depression. Depression. That's a disease process. But what are other morbid conditions? Um, Can drug abuse? Socioeconomic status. Can drug abuse be like a morbid? <coughs> It's more like a disease, too. But, I mean, it can, it can be various. Health status. When we're looking at health status, what are we looking at? Overall. Access, yes. Right, I can talk about health status. What else? Quality of life. Hmm? Other things that health status. Food quality. Nutrition. Nutrition. Okay. What else? Lifestyle. Is it just the absence of disease? No. no. Can you have a disease process and feel healthy? Yes. 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 Okay. So it's not the uh, not the absence of disease <coughs> that will determine health status. Okay. What else do you have to factor in to know that this person um, has good health? What do you look at for good health? Quality of life. A sense of well-being. When you say quality of life, it's like a sense of well-being. Okay. And what gives you a sense of well-being? Is it just I don't have hypertension or I don't have diabetes that gives you a sense of well-being? No, like your lifestyle. It's physical, it's physical mental, social, emotional, psychological. All these will factor into what your health status is. Because you can be in prime physical condition, um, but you are severely depressed, okay? And a severely depressed person could be dead before you know it. Um, I saw my friend, uh, spoke to my friend, I should say, a few weeks before he committed suicide. And I thought he was fine, because he was like <coughs> normal, you know, we laughed, and Nowhere did I think for one second that he was not in a good sense of well-being. And a few weeks later, they called me and told me that he committed suicide. And that was very difficult for me because I know I had just spoken to him and he was totally fine. And I just didn't understand, you know. But totally fine is not just physically being okay. Okay, totally fine means that all these aspects of your whole well-being is aligned. Okay? And so when we're looking at our patients, we have to look at all these. So, <coughs> surveillance. Okay? 
Our assessment team hopefully has started surveillancing the city of Hollywood. Uh, I know they are because I'm on their WhatsApp chat and they've been doing a lot of work. But ongoing scrutiny of populations disease, experience the tech changes and occurrences, distribution, the data collection, analysis, interpretation, and reporting. So <clears throat> what does this tell me? Who does surveillance? <coughs> U.S. Census Bureau, researchers, yeah. Department of Health. Okay. Um, they report disease processes. So, how do we know how many how many HIV people are in the neighborhood? We report it to them. We have to report they it. Report. Okay. <coughs> so, if not, there's the hospital. Oh, okay. clinic. To see it to the. What if you're in a doctor's office and you test positive for okay. HIV? With the report, they report, report that they have a have patient with HIV. Okay. Um, what are other reportable diseases? TB, one of the big ones. Gonorrhea, syphilis. These are all reportable diseases. The dengue. <coughs> dengue fever. Yeah. Okay. H1N1. Okay. What about um, the flu, no. But no. H1N1, that variant is. Like the measles? Right. If somebody has measles. Measles, mumps, rubella, mm -hmm. polio. Mm -hmm. If these things are coming back, then we got to watch report out. Report it. Yeah. So these are reportable illnesses. We all have to report them to the CDC. Okay? What type of investigations to help do we do? In case we didn't mention this, this is a very interactive class. Everybody talks. <laughs> And if you don't know me, I walk through the aisles. If you're not listening to me, I deliberately call you. If you're not talking to me enough, I like attention. I seek attention. Investigations, how do we investigate health? What do we do? Screenings. We do a lot of screenings. Who else? What else do we do? A lot of research that will come under studies. Monitoring. Who do we monitor? Patients. The population, our community. <coughs> What's in our community? But what do we want to investigate, though? Do we only want to investigate if there's TV? No. What else do we want to investigate? How do we know? What are the needs? Like, what are the needs? What type of needs do a community have? Mm -hmm. Tell me. If they have access, access to, to, like, health care. Like access healthcare, to health care. Treatment or screening. How do you know when there's access to health care? You see clinics or urgent care. Mm -hmm. or, or you talk to the doctor's offices and there's people. You go to the places, right? Mm -hmm. Like in yeah. schools? Right. When was your last checkup? For less oh, disease yeah. in the community. How about looking at what disease processes plague that community? Okay, so if I am surveillance in the community of um, Opalaka, and I'm a doctor's office in Opalaka, and I can tell you that nine out of 10 people who come to see me have hypertension. Mm -hmm. What do I have to look at in Opalaka? All, the, all the issues like the that can cause hypertension, exactly. right? <laughs> So I have to figure out what in that community is driving this much hypertension. Okay, these are the things that are going to prompt these investigations. They're going to prompt these studies, and so these are the things that we have to look at in order to basically be able to treat the community. Okay. So what is health promotion? I like this word. The process of empowering people to increase control over their health as and its determinants through health literacy efforts and multi-sector action to increase health behaviors. I want somebody to break that down for me. The process of empowering giving somebody the control over it. their health care over their health. How do you give people control? Education. Yes. Education. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Access. Yes. Okay. That's how you empower them. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I'm going to tell you diabetes kills. <laughs> yeah. It does, and it should. 
But that's not even that's that's not a, is that empowering? No. Me? No. no. If I'm a diabetic and you tell me that, I'd be like, you want to give up. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> if I eat the chocolate cake, I'm going to be happy. I'll probably die from diabetes, but at least I'm going to die happy. <laughs> you know? So, but what do you have to do to make sure that a person with diabetes understands not just that they're going to die from diabetes, but that before their that. bilateral lower extremity is going to be cut off before they die? Can I fail? Yeah. How do you give them education? What education do you give them? So, when you do your surveillance, let's say you do your surveillance, the, health, um, the assessment team comes back and says to you, there's a predominance of um, HIV in the Hollywood community, okay? So that's, that's what you see. Now, the research team is gonna look at HIV, right? This is my research team over here, I know because they're all friends, they're all together. <laughs> so the research team is gonna look at HIV, and you're gonna look at what are the physical, emotional, sociocultural aspects of HIV that's gonna impact that community, correct? Okay. And then you're gonna come up with a plan. So when you're looking at those aspects of HIV, what do you wanna to do to make sure that um, when you're delivering that information to the people that they, they get it? What do you wanna look at? The needs. Level. They need the knowledge. 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 knowledge of what? Health they, literacy. The disease. What's health, health literacy? literacy? Somebody said it. Who said health literacy? What does health literacy mean? How much they know and understand yeah. regarding yeah. their yeah. disease yeah. processes. Okay. So I know everything about HIV. Like I know, I know the pathophysiological process. I know all that. Is that going to help me? No. How to transition to real life. Okay. What does that mean? Like safe sexual practices. Okay. Um, but does that, how does that help me? I'm just diagnosed with HIV now. Like, you just diagnosed me now with HIV. After you're diagnosed. I'm diagnosed. Yeah. Things that you can do now to prevent, you know, either viral, I mean, medication-wise, or okay. preventing you to transfer to your loved one. Okay. With. Okay. Okay. Teach them resources. Resources. That is the most important thing that healthcare providers forget to tell patients. Where they can go to get treatment. Health literacy means that they understand their disease process, they understand what it does to their body, they know where to go to get treatment, and how this treatment will impact their lives. So health literacy is not just knowing what the disease is. It's knowing how to treat it, how to access care, where to go for that care, and when. How much are you going to pay for that care? And if you can't pay for it, what are the resources available to you? When you make somebody literate about their disease process, they understand all that. They understand that there's a free clinic in Fort Lauderdale on First Street, when you pass the Wendy's, <coughs> right there. The person at the front desk name is Gwen. She has your information. She will take care of you. And when you go there, you don't have to take any money. Okay? Because Gwen knows your situation. She knows how to treat you at this point. When he goes to Gwen, Gwen is going to give him all the information that he needs, when he needs to come back, what meds he's gonna be on, or she's gonna be on, when she takes them, where he goes, or she goes, to get these meds, and what's the cost associated with it. That is health leaders. And that is what we don't do for our patients. Because we tell them, you have diabetes and you have to take this med, but we don't tell them where to go to get it. And we don't tell them how much it's gonna cost and if they can even afford it. So how are they gonna get treated? We only do one part of it. It doesn't go any further than that, okay? So when we talk about health literacy, 
we talk about all aspects, giving patients <coughs> open access to knowledge regarding the disease process, how to treat it, where to treat it, and how um, economical um, access to care, um, what they have available and what they don't have available. <coughs> when we did our health fair one year, we did our health fair and we had a patient who was diagnosed with HIV. He had tested positive for HIV right there. He had no knowledge of having HIV. Um, he tested positive and he tested positive in the truck, um, the HIV screening truck. Um, we had the um, insurance agent right there because when we called for the, um, when we did our surveillance and we realized there's a homeless population that was rampant in that area and then HIV was rampant in that area, we got um, someone who talked about uh, access to medications, we got an insurance person um, for HIV and then the HIV screening. So when that person screened positive, that person was able to be walked out by the testing people, they were able to get counsel, they were able to go by the insurance company um, right there to get access, they were able to talk to their representative about their meds, so they had everything right there, ready and waiting. And that was like a win. That was like, if we did nothing right the next, for the rest of the day, <coughs> at least we did that. Yeah. And we did not know this was happening because we were told, I was told by the, the HIV people, they can't tell me who and they can't tell me when it's happening. But they, at the end, um, when he sent me the email, he said, just want you to know that we have one person tested positive. We had all the resources available to him. Thank you for your health care. You guys did an amazing job getting everybody together because we were able to put him through the whole process in that one afternoon. That is success. Only one person you save, but once you save somebody, okay? So who is impacted? The community at large, okay? It's not just one person. It's communities that we're looking at. What are we addressing? Tobacco use. Remember? We used to think that if I didn't smoke, I was okay, but the person who smoked right next to me was, you know, just living their life, but then you were inhaling it, and now we found out the secondhand smoke killed. Um, diet, physical activity, or physical inactivity. Mental health is a big issue in our community. Big Most issue. people who are homeless have some kind of mental health, issue, right? Um, most people. And the reason they're out on the streets is because our mental health system is very poor and inadequately uh, financed. If you look at all the statistics regarding mental health on the CDC or the World Health Organization, they'll tell you that we do not adequately address mental health. Um, and that's why a lot of our population <coughs> suffers tremendously okay, from mental health issues. Um, drug abuse, alcohol control, um, or drug abuse control, um, Health behaviors related to HIV, um, talking about um, uh, protective barriers, how you protect yourself, how do you get treated when you have HIV. And when you have HIV, it's not just about physical treatment, it's mental, emotional, making sure you have all the support systems that you do need, okay? Um, and sexual health, too. Um, you have a 70 year old woman comes into your clinic and um, on your clinic sheet you ask everybody who is below 65 about sexual activity and that 70 year old woman you say um, I'm going to skip this because you're not having sex <laughs> but they have sex more than you I know, it's not true. <laughs> and they say they're going to die tomorrow so they're going to enjoy life so she's going to have sex with Tom and Scott, mm -hmm. and maybe Sue, because she never tried that. <laughs> they have no, they have no parameters. No like they just go at it. But when we screen them, we don't ask them because we're afraid to engage in that conversation. Right? And so sexual health is very important for us to address. Elderly, young people, old people, so, health promotion. The World Health Organization um, basically did the first um, international conference on health promotion in 1986 in Cote d'Ivoire. Okay. Um, and the objective is basically health for all. 
They started that in 1986, and we're in 2020, and we still have not accomplished that, but we're trying, okay? Um, but we're trying to accomplish health for all in whatever system that we can possibly get that done. Strategies for health promotion. Um, advocacy. I love when nurses say, I'm a patient advocate. It's nice. It rolls off our tongues really nice. But what does that really mean? All aspects for the patient. Mm -hmm. okay. What does that mean? Speak up for the patient. Speak up for the patient. I mean, like, uh, defend the patient, you know? Social everything. Be sure that the chart is safe. Be sure he has all the social people coming to the need. Be sure he has. Support. You know how many times I go into a room to see a patient who just had a surgical procedure, a neurosurgical procedure, and they've been in a prone position for six hours getting rods and screws put in their backs. And I go into the room, a day or two after, they have no SCDs on. They have never gotten up out of the bed. Because the nurse says, oh, they didn't want to get up. They're telling me that they're in too much pain. But then, out of the same breath, they say, I'm a patient advocate. But how are you a patient advocate? Because we know DVT is our stasis, mm -hmm. and we know the minute we cut into the body, our adaptive immune system says, fire at it, <laughs> okay? And so we know that our complement system that gets activated, our coagulation system gets activated, and when they get activated, that's why we're at increased risk for DVTs, okay? And so, if we don't get those patients up, how are we advocating for them? Because in two days, they're going to have a DVT. But they didn't have a DVT because I advocated for them. They had a DVT because I didn't. So I like to put that out there because a lot of times we say we're advocates, but we're thinking that we have to make sure the big things are taken care of. But when you're an advocate, even the tiniest things need to be looked at. And that's what we usually forget, okay? Um, so when we're advocating for our children, for our community, I have a, a very good friend of mine. Um, every time I tell the story, I get mad at her again. Because she says to me, um, she wasn't um, a, a Obama fan. She did not like him. He had different beliefs than she did. And I was fine with that. Some more of that. But she was very upset when Michelle Obama talked about improving the school lunch 